On that day, Guruji was in the room, in the house we were traveling, and Guruji was breathing very badly. And everybody passed by the room and said, Guruji, do you need water? Do you need something? Guruji, no, no. Guruji, what is, what's happening to you? People are really afraid for Guruji. Mm. Guruji in another country. And Guruji said, no, 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 like Tandav's daughter, my name was Tandav. Tandav's daughter will be okay. Uh, well, what happened to me? Ah, she's sick, but she'll be okay. I gave a piece of my heart to her. Mm. So imagine, Guruji gave a piece of his physical heart somehow, to my baby daughter, so she lives from, instead of passing the six months, we can have like a beautiful love family experience with Guruji holding our hands, instead of six days, six months. And then when it has to finish, it's finished. Jai Gurudev everybody. Today I'm here with Rishi Arada Kananda. Jai Gurudev Swamiji. Jai Gurudev. So, he's a disciple of Paramahamsa Rishpananda, um, great musician and... Try. Well, well, great musician, don't be too humble. And um, yeah, uh, a brother for many, many years on the spiritual path. And so, it would be nice if you share a little bit about your spiritual path and like most of the times, I'm mostly interested, how did it all start? How it all started? <clears throat> or better, let's say like this, were you always interested in spirituality? Mm. Or was there a certain event which triggered something? No, actually, I was always interested in spirituality. It was always part of me. When I was a child, I was always talking to God in my thoughts. And I would play as a child that the first thought that comes in my mind, I, was, I would take it his answer. Okay. Yeah, as a little child. And then I became uh, like a heavy metal boy, 13 until 16. And I lived this deeply, like hardcore. And then I denied everything. I went to a very mystical side, but the opposite. Uh -huh. you know, trying to go deep to like find goth. the other side. Yeah. Gothic. Yes. Like, yeah. Really dark, really dark things negative things and have heavy experiences. But I, I also observed it was a spiritual search. Mm -hmm. like, you know. But the, the, you said like you were talking with God in your mind. That means yeah. that the whole concept of God is something which you have grown up with. It's from your family yes, already. Yes. Like We were never Christians. My father, big devotee of St. Anthony. My mm -hmm. mom's a spiritist. Like in Brazil, we have this... Um, it's a doctrine that is very big in Brazil. Uh, which is, was founded by a French guy called Alain Kardec. So it has Christian okay. values, but you talk to spirits, basically, through okay. mediums. Okay. And, um, but I was never baptized Christian. So my first baptism was actually into Kriya Yoga from Yogananda. So often the, the Indian, Indian devotees, Indian people from around the world, they write this. So when did you convert to Hinduism? So I'm an original Hindu. Mm -hmm. My first initiation of baptism was actually direct into Kriya Yoga in Brazil. Because, so I was in that dark phase, mm -hmm. and my auntie, she gave me the autobiography of a yogi. Mm -hmm. I was 14, I read, I remember it touched me deeply, but then I put it to the side and I went back to my heavy metal. And then some awakening happened, let's say, at a certain point, and I always had this book and the picture. Some awakening of, happened, like, by itself, or there was, like moments or you were practicing or you were taking drugs or I don't know. Like, yeah, I, don't, I didn't really take heavy drugs or anything like that. I, I did drink more than enough. But the awakening, was it like something trig triggered by something? Yeah, I mean, I was always searching for something and I, what I perceived that I went to a period of depression. Mm -hmm. and, and then I remember one day, I was feeling like lifeless and, and weird and everything was bad in life, everything was you know, making no sense. And I remember one day I woke up and I changed my mindset. I just one day, I just said, enough. Mm. And I remember my mom asking me like, why well, I look different today? I said, I don't know, I want to change. Like mm. enough with this mm. negativity, enough with depression. Mm. Then I started doing martial arts again, like exercising, running in the beach, you know, like, mm -hmm. like the Rocky, the movie, you know? Mm -hmm. 
And, um, and then I started to read more about yoga and, 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 and search for different spirits of stuff. I started with Paulo Coelho books and then Yogananda and Swami Rama and some Brazilian alien stuff like Trigueirinho. He, like, he talks about aliens a lot, alien uh, civilizations on the earth, inside of earth, outside of earth. And, and, but Yogananda was what was shining the most. And it was the greatest inspiration. Yeah. So I also started going to the center. There's a big center actually in my city, in Salvador. So, SRF, yeah. South Organization Fellowship. And I became then a musician there. I was singing the kirtans there, learning a bit of tabla. Like, they bore me the instrument. So yeah. that was my first contact to kirtan. I had, then I entered the university in Brazil. I was a SRF devotee. So you learned that you learned Kriya Yoga from yeah. the Yogananda lineage. 2006. 2006. What age you were at that time? Uh, 17. 17. Yeah. And then? Then I entered the music university in Brazil. I remember I had some friends uh, from different, like we had like the spiritual cell, let's say, in the university, in the music university. Like four or five friends, we were all studying composition, most of us. And a friend, he was from ISKCON, Jumari, he's still a friend of mine, Narasimha Das. Another friend from Brahma Kumaris, another friend from, he called Yuga Vidya, but it's not the same Yuga Vidya from Germany. And Shivananda. Shivananda and, and, yeah, there was one more, that I don't remember exactly what he was practicing, but we were like the spiritual guys, and we were always sharing spirituality together, and playing sometimes, and. And so that's the first contact I actually had with the Vaishnavism. It's through this, this Hare Krishna friend. While I, I was, he called me yogi because I was basically just doing Kriya and meditating one hour a day or something. Mm -hmm. How long did you practice, like for how many years did you practice Kriya Yoga? Like the Kriya Yoga of Yogananda? So at the initial exercises was 2005 and the Kriya itself, because you have to do some pre-exercises. The Kriya itself I got 2006 and in Guruji's Kriya 2011, but from 2006 basically I never stopped. And like uh, when, when I met you the first time you were mm. actually a Pretarian, Pretarian it said, mm. no like uh, no, no eating. Mm. Um, I was very strict, it's never fully changed but uh, I was very strict. <laughs> consuming just prana or living on prana. And liquids. Living on, yeah. on uh, how was that? Because you told me a little bit that that was also part of you wanting to show yourself and I think probably the world that... That God exists. That was my motivation. So how is that? <clears throat> so this is, I think the, the pranic process actually was a purification for me to, to meet Guruji. I'll explain to you. Mm -hmm. When so, did it start? Like, so just yeah. to have the timeline. So on the autobiography of a yogi, when I first read when I was 14, then I read about Giri Bala and about Teresa Neumann. It's inside mm -hmm. the book there. And that stayed in my mind. And then when I was still in Brazil, sometime later, I was watching some interview show late night on TV. And there was this couple, a Brazilian lady and an American guy. I forgot her name now. They were basically being interviewed about that. So they mm -hmm. said, oh, I, I made this 21 days process and we are like one year not eating and we are fine and we have a doctor here that testifies. And she says, my husband's a saxophone player. He can play saxophone, you know, requires energy, breath mm -hmm. and stuff. And so that stayed in my mind for a long time. My parents didn't like the idea at all, but I ordered the book that explained that process. And so basically this was just in the back of my mind almost every day. Meanwhile, my life changed. My guitar teacher told me to move to Germany or America to study. So I was in Germany studying and, and left the university in Brazil. When started. did you move to Germany? In 2007. 2007. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, in the end of 2007. So I came, 2008, I officially started the studies here. So in 2011, and then life kind of converged so that I actually did this process. Um, just a bit before I prayed to God, I was every day thinking about it, doing my Kriya from Yogananda and every day thinking about this process. About this pranic yeah. 
And then one day I got fed up and I said, God, if you want me to do that, you have to give me a sign. And the sign has to be, I need to meet somebody who lives like that and spend some time with such a person. Mm -hmm. So I send this message to the universe. <laughs> <laughs> and then I was in a, there was a social media called Orkut. It was very big in Brazil. I was living in Germany, but I was using that social media back then. Before Facebook was a thing. So um, there was a little community online on breatharianism. Mm -hmm. And there was one guy who is now my friend, Oberon. He's actually just releasing a really nice um, documentary on, on yoga and stuff called Muko. He got many prizes. Oberon, he wrote in that group, I will be in Europe giving talks on that and on yoga in general and Patanjali, that's his field. And he will be going from Munich to Paris, but there's a week break. If anybody lives between these two places, could receive him at home. And I lived in Saarbrücken, like exactly mm. between mm. Munich and, and, and Paris. Mm -hmm. So I wrote him, said, if you want, you can just stay in my house. And just took some hours, he already confirmed. So he came to my house and stayed, I mean, my student house. We were like one kitchen, one living room, four students living together. He stayed in my room together. Mm -hmm. We had a really great time, we did yoga together, he was just drinking water and I was just eating German bread. If, if I would take anything else, I would feel ashamed in front of him. He was strong and, and, and was super nice. And I, I organized some little talks in yoga studios for him. And at the end of these days, I realized, oops, that was my prayer. Mm -hmm. Now I have to do this. <laughs> so his family has a farm in Brazil, like a little retreat center for doing the process and other kind of retreats. Mm -hmm. So they have like 11 little huts in the forest. His mom was the first to do the process, then his father, and then he plus two other brothers and sisters. So the whole family lives like this. Back when, they, I, when I made the process in 2011, he was already 14 years living like this. Wow. And Just living on liquid. Yeah. He said sometimes he would eat some soup because his wife was not... Uh, Breatharian, so she would cook soup and he would have soup with her and stuff like this. So basically, I, I did the process. I, next summer holidays, I went to Brazil, to his place, and I did the process. Mm -hmm. And in that process, on the third day, you spend the first seven days without water. And then they say, in the first three days, you get weak. And then on the fourth day, you start to feel better. They all say that. And it was ex exactly like that. Um, on the third night, I was feeling cramps on my legs, something was happening to me, I vomited something green. And on the fourth day, I started to feel better. And then on the seventh day, you start drinking some water and your body mm -hmm. starts to come back. And it actually worked, and that's it. And then you stayed for like that? Ah, on, the, on that first week, I had a dream with Yogananda, my only and last dream with Yogananda. He came, he was in an European castle, like a tower. Mm -hmm. And he walked down the castle and gave me a hug. And for the first time, I felt a confirmation that to do this process was actually okay mm -hmm. for him, because I was just doing his techniques. Otherwise, I never did anything spiritually that was not really from, from him and since I got initiated. Mm -hmm. And I always had this little insecurity that I'm doing something extra. Mm -hmm. So I did the, the process and in the let's say, the 21-day process. On the day 22, somebody was driving me to the bus station. So I would go back home. And this is the moment where I believe, like, my connection to Guruji, Swami Vishwananda, kind of got a new wire, let's say, mm. before right. I met him physically. Because I was, <clears throat> this guy was telling me in the car, let's say, B-side stories from Yogananda that I never heard because they're not on the official books from SRF. And then he said, um, you know, there's this prophecy <coughs> that Yogananda was in California. And then he said, I will come back to this earth, uh, to this temple, clap and sing, and nobody will recognize me. Hmm. Yogananda said that. And the moment he said that, I felt such a pain in my heart. 
Then I remember I closed my eyes and I made a strong prayer. And I was in this miracle mindset because I was 21 days not eating, feeling great. Mm -hmm. So I was like, I'm living a miracle. <laughs> no, yeah. I, was, I was supposed to die in the fourth day. Mm -hmm. I was feeling great. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, wow, I was like a super like yogi. You know? 22 days, no food and no water. Seven days, no water, but seven already no water. water since, since the seventh day, you start water again. And then I made this prayer. I closed my eyes and I said, Guruji, if you are on earth, please let me be with you. So that was March 2011. And in September 2011, I met Swami Ah. So that's why I believe this prayer was when Guruji said, OK, enough, now you can meet me. Mm -hmm. You because, were ready. Yeah, because I was living in Zabrücken. You, for sure, were traveling with Guruji to France every week. From here, where we live, to France, you drive through Zabrücken, the autobahn drives in the middle of the city, mm -hmm. which is like 10 minutes from my room. Mm. Like, f how many times I was there, Guruji was just like some one kilometer passing by me, mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> Interesting. So you, you were making that prayer. Um, I remember you told me it was Swami Kanchalochana was doing a program where you yeah, that's how heard about Bhakti Marga and Paramahamsa Vishwananda. At that time you were also like you, you were married or mm. in, married or in a relationship like? Uh, I think, let me see. Yeah, I was already legally married when I met mm -hmm. him. And like then what happened? Like you you got to know about Paramahamsa Vishwananda, you you came here. Yeah. Basically when I met um Brahmachari Chaturananda nowadays, Swami Kanjalochana, we became like best friends. Mm -hmm. Like in that first meeting. We had a he had a lecture and then he was talking about at the end of his lecture he said, so I live in an ashram in Germany, there's my Guruji. He showed the picture. And to be honest, I look and said, mm, I'm not looking for any Guru. I have my Yogananda. Ah, okay. And then he said, ah, and we also follow Mahavata Babaji, and we are also Vaishnavas. I'm like, ah, oh, Babaji, let's go talk to this guy. I like Babaji. You know? And then we started talking, and then he said, oh, let's talk more. And then we sat outside, and we talked for three hours. And I remember we crying. We were talking about God, and we were crying. Mm, nice. Yeah. So he said, now you have to come visit me in my ashram. I was like, mm, okay. <laughs> I, I come for you, I, yeah. I thought. No? Uh -huh. And then I, came. then I met Guruji, actually. In 2012? 11. 2011. Mm. How long did you know Guruji? 2011? You were here two years or something. Mm. Or? 2008. You met yeah, him. 2009, 2008, that I moved in here. So, yeah. yes. I remember you with the glasses walking around. Mm -hmm. I remember we were making music, I was stringing the guitar, and you were looking at me like, and then once I gave it to you, and you were like, and I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> this was the big days of Guru Parane mm. in the light hall darshans. Oh, yeah, it was cool. Amazing days. Yeah. And um, so, 2000, end of 2011, you came, you met Guruji. Was it immediately clear that this is your path, that he's your guru? Was there like, what? No, uh, it was, I mean, when my first meeting with Guruji was actually quite amazing. I, I saw Guruji, I was somewhere close to the reception, or maybe close to the dining hall nowadays. And Guruji came with free hair and a black jacket in a Thursday night, like 10 o'clock in the evening. And I was just actually making a tour in the ashram the whole day. Maybe would spend the night there, maybe drive back. And then suddenly Guruji arrives. We were not sure if he would already arrive on that day. And when I saw him far away, like imagine dining hall, like maybe, I don't know, 100 meters, 50 mm -hmm. meters. I saw him and I smelled roses. Mm. Like, oh my God, what's this? Like, I see this guy. Poof. And we had, I knew I could eventually meet the Swami from the ashram, so I had some minimum of Indian uh, etiquette. etiquette, so I brought some flowers. So I took the flowers that were somewhere close by, and then Kanjalochana introduced me, he said, oh, this is Luis from Brazil, he's a musician, he lives on Brana. That was the introduction. Mm -hmm. And then I gave this um, Flower. flowers to Guruji, and before Guruji, let's say, gave me the flowers. And then before he takes the flower, he touched my hands. Mm -hmm. And his hands were like burning hot, like really crazy hot. And then I was like, oh my God, what's this? Hot hands, like weirdly hot hands. 
And then he looked deep in my eyes, you know, when his eyes move a little bit, mm -hmm. like his eyes are wet and then they like move a bit like this and look deep inside of me. And it was, it was like 10 seconds, my brain was smashed. Mm -hmm. And then he became normal and then he took the flowers. So what do you do? This and that, where you come from exactly? And he became sweet, we had a nice talk. So he basically showed me he's not human on the very first encounter. And then it took me, let's say, I think it was September. I remember then there was one of Aratri, and then I traveled to India. I had already a ticket to India when I met Guruji for the first Indian trip. Mm -hmm. And we went to India, came back, me and my ex-wife. And I remember when I was in India, I was, I was already calling Guruji, Guruji. It was one month after the meeting, but I was still in the process not fully accepting it, a bit afraid of the changes, a bit afraid of the judgment of the SRF people mm -hmm. from the centers in Brazil, in Germany, because I used to meet them the whole time. You know? mm -hmm. And I think but by November, December, I was like, okay, I, I'm going to put all my cards on Guruji. It's everything for him. Was there a special moment or like a, a something which which made you aware he is your Sadhguru, because that's obviously... I remember two events. One, we were in, I was walking the lobby, some event was going on in here. Um, Guruji passed in the opposite direction, and then he looked inside of my third eye, just like this, out of nowhere. He said, oh, you do Kriya every day, yeah? Mm. It's like, oh my God, this, this Sadhguru is amazing. And then I got very proud. I got super proud and I was like, yes, Guruji, since that many years, never missed a day. And Guruji, do you have the second Kriya from SRF? I said, no, because you're going to understand the first one is enough for realization. And Guruji, the first one is not even a Kriya yet. He <laughs> turned his back and left. <laughs> like he put me up, then boom. Mm. <laughs> I remember this, shook me. And then uh, when he called me to the interview room, made my manifested a ring to me and we had a deep talk um, yeah we had a deep talk and we talked about some some things that kind of made my heart ready mm. to accept him and then there was the moment when I came to him innocently and asked Guruji maybe the Kriyas are the same you know I, for me you are not different from that other master there I love you all you know, all this universalist talk and do you think I need to get also this new Kriya or is it enough I practice the Kriya that I already do? And then I remember Guruji came to my side like this on the reception desk, the old small reception desk, remember the wood ones, mm -hmm. mom? And then he put his hands on me like this and it was so swift and he was like again looking somewhere and he said, no, you do this one, do ours, do ours. Mm -hmm. and, and yeah, that was around these days. Yeah. And then, like, you were... But it, it was, let's say, sorry, a slow process. Slow process. Yeah. But it was... Like, clarity was there when, like, there was a moment of, like... Yeah. Because I remember for myself, like, to accept, to, to meet the Sadhguru. The, when I met him the first time, the people I was with, they knew something special was going on. You I, I denied it. I was like, no, I'm not going to... Yeah, it's nothing so special, yeah. But it was obvious; it was too obvious. So there's, I think, when you meet the Sadhguru, at least for me, there was there's also a certain, there's a certain there's the joy and the fear at the same time. It's like a mixture of. You know, feelings. your whole life's about to change. Exactly. Like people are gonna think you are crazy. All your little structures will be broken. So that's why it takes time. Actually. You can't fool yourself anymore. You can't. Because you know he's so special, you're going to be an idiot if you don't follow him. And, and, you, <laughs> want, and you can't fool him. You Not at all. So he will show you what you need to learn. Yeah. Uh, and funny enough, my ex-wife, when we were still together, she was much quicker, like surrendering. Mm -hmm. you know, like, mm -hmm. I want to be his devotee finish. Mm -hmm. And I was more rational. And it's funny when we observe the devotees coming all these years, you know, it's always the same. Like normally in that first moment, women have the 
more they're open more heart. Open, they're more too. They quickly jump to Guruji's feet and the man two or three steps back and mm -hmm. wait and mm -hmm. look. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's yeah. normal. You, I remember you, you were together with your, with your ex-wife and you also had a child together. I, I know mm -hmm. there was a tra tragic incident then where mm -hmm. you also lost a child. I know you mm -hmm. want to share some something what comes from that lesson or what was that yeah. Leela for you? I don't know. I mean, this Leela is very deep, actually. The other day I was sharing this with some Chinese people and everybody was crying, but let's do a little bit here. <laughs> <laughs> so all these Chinese <laughs> devotees crying. So when I went to India and I came back, as I told you, I met mm -hmm. Guruji, I already had this ticket to Varanasi in Vrindavan. Secretly, because we, we were married only um, legally. legally. So we went to a Shiva temple in Varanasi, one of the oldest. Don't remember the name now. So Swayambhu Shiva Lingam somewhere. A bit, you have to walk maybe half an hour from, from Vishwanath in the other direction. Kashi Vishwanath. So I went, we went there, came to a priest and said, can you marry us? The guy opened a big smile and said, okay, did I even ask for money? Well, it's a rare thing. Huh? And brought us mm -hmm. to a side Shiva Lingam, not the main one. He spent like one hour doing mantras and walking around, then took um, garlands for the Shiva Lingam, put on us and make the whole thing. Then we gave a donation in the end. And then we went to a side street, like a shop in the street, and we, we made some copper rings, mm -hmm. like cheap copper rings, mm -hmm. so symbolic ring. So we came back to Germany and met Guruji just some weeks later after we came back, or even less. And I thought it was an amazing thing. We just had an amazing spiritual wedding in an old ancient Shiv temple, temple in Varanasi. And I came to meet Guruji, and when I met Guruji, also in the lobby, I remember, Guruji's eyes were straight in that ring. Mm. And he took my hands, and I thought it was amazing, whatever happened. And Guruji made a face which was really an unhappy face. And it was the first time Guruji was not sweet to me. Mm. He was weirdly strict. He made a bit of a disgusted face, Look at my ring and said, Huh? Are you married? Mm. And it was like, I didn't understand. So I was like, what's happening? Why he react like this? So I kind of didn't understand and ignored. Mm, okay, it's Guruji. Mm. Life goes on. So my ex-wife got, we discovered she was uh, pregnant shortly after that. And then the story basically happened. So she, first Guruji would always come to us and say, so when is the delivery? When you go to the hospital? And we said, no, Guruji, we don't go to the hospital. We do like a home birth in water. Uh, okay, nice. Some days later, we are back here. We moved close by to the ashram. So when is the delivery? When you go to the hospital? No, Guruji, we're going to do it at home, in the warm, in the water. Ah, okay. Again and again. Mm -hmm. when, when you go to the hospital, Guruji, you forgot again. We're not going to the hospital. We are doing it at home. Now I know, if Guruji asks two times, one actually should be enough, but two times for sure he's not asking, he's telling you something. That's Go what Guruji is. That's what Guruji is saying. So the delivery day came, 24 hours work and, and the baby didn't come out. And then the, the lady who was helping us at home said, okay, I finished my job here, it's too much for the mother. Go to the hospital and have the baby there. Mm -hmm. And then... Look, Guruji has been asking us the whole time this. That's what he wanted to say. Why, Guruji, why you don't say directly? Guruji is like this. If you're not ready to listen, listen. he doesn't say directly. Yeah. So we went to the hospital, gave an injection, the baby came fine. Just to relax the mom, yeah. and then it was okay. Nothing was detected, the baby was fine. Guruji gave the name. We come back home. My parents came from Brazil on the sixth day. Suddenly, our daughter, Sharda, she was um, a bit bluish, the fingers mm -hmm. and the mouth. And she was breathing weird and we were panicking, of course. So we run to a doctor. The doctor said, it's not my case. We are a home doctor. We have to run to the hospital. We drive crazy to the hospital. And then we go to one hospital and they think it's uh, some breath, some, some bad cold or something giving her antibiotics, but it's not helping anything. 
And then she's been from that hospital to another hospital and, and we're there waiting, nervous, and then a doctor calls us to talk in a private room. And then we realize, oops, something is about to happen now. Mm -hmm. They are shaking already. And then the doctor tells us, look, uh, it's a life-changing thing what I'm going to tell you, but we detected a heart condition in your daughter. Uh, in English it's called hypoplastic left heart syndrome, what means the left heart is way too small, only the right side of the heart makes the whole job. Mm. So she has to go straight away to a surgery. It's already weird, he said, it's already weird that she lived well so these first six days. Science can explain, but she was too well. She was too normal. Because um, in the beginning, when the, the first days after the birth, the heart and the lungs are still making the connection. Because first, it was, everything was connected to the mother. And it takes mm -hmm. some days until the connections are done. So when the connections were closing, then she could not breathe properly. So they have to make an operation so that the right heart make the both uh, jobs mm -hmm. from the whole heart. And he said, 10 years ago, she would die straight away. But nowadays, it's three operations. There's a chance. And then if the operation go okay, she's going to be a normal person. Maybe not an athlete, but a normal person. And wow, amazing. So on that, so and then from that hospital, he sent us to another hospital on the same day. The university hospital in Mainz, we were in Wiesbaden. And I remember that was the moment when I actually called Guruji. I could, Guruji was traveling. I believe in America. So I called him and Guruji was super calm. Guruji, like we discovered this, this, this is terrible. It's like a nightmare. And he's so calm, he's like, oh, but she's better now, no? But is she? Then, because Guruji was so peaceful, then I also calmed down. And then on the end of that day, the doctor told me something. He said, look, on that, at this time of the day, when she was on the ambulance, moving from one hospital to the other, she actually died in the ambulance. On the sixth day, all the organs stopped, even the blood stopped flowing. And protocol, we kept trying to revive her, but we didn't have faith she would come back. But actually, at a certain point, she just came back. Mm. And on this moment, Guruji was, I was talking to Guruji, more or less, it was that time. And Guruji was super calm. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, no, she's better now. And she, he basically brought her back to life mm -hmm. yeah, on the sixth day. And then she went to the hospital, Mainz, and we would wait there as long as we have a space for the surgery in another hospital in Bonn, far away. Mm. Suddenly there's a space, next day she's in the helicopter flying to the surgery, to the operation. Mm. So she made the operation, everything was okay. It's tough, I mean literally on the first days you go to see her, she's of course um, sleeping and you can see the open chest and the heart beating. Because the heart has to heal, the heart has to heal with open chest because if there's anything they have to intervene. Mm. And then after it heals they close. And they said, look, she's going to stay in the hospitals until the second operation. But one month after, she was already so good that they sent her back home. They said, let her grow. And then we do the second operation after she grows a bit. So we had like, she was just getting better and better. At a certain point, we even didn't, didn't need to check anymore her O2 because normally we had a device checking the oxygen in the blood. Mm -hmm. We could let go of the O2 and she was basically strong health baby mm -hmm. and Guruji was always giving us the booty and doing this and making small miracles and we were thinking okay that's it maybe she doesn't even need other operation what is she had a little shunt artificial plastic thing in the heart but has to be removed at certain point but she was so fine and the doctors were always postponing Guruji one, once said um, she came like this not because she has karma he said but because she's taking karma mainly from the mother side family. Mm. That was Guruji's words. It's a private thing to share, but whatever. It's not <laughs> private anymore once it's <laughs> going on that. <laughs> and then she was fine. I remember I was in a castle in, in Zweibrücken, Pfalz, playing in the birthday of an 80 years old woman. And then when I received the call for my then wife, ex-wife, saying, come quickly, 
she's not okay. It was right after I finished my gig. Then I drive home. And when I got, I got to see her trying to be revived again. It was already, she was six months, January 2013. She basically, like this, just passed away in the arms of the grandmother. And Guruji wow. said, stay in the calm of the mother's family. Wow. From the mother's grandmother. Just like this, she breathed two times, <laughs> boom, left. There was 1% chance that could happen because of the heart, a little artificial thing that was making the job. So, and then to make uh, it a bit interesting, so when this happened, of course, we went to hospitals and this and that. I remember there was a Catholic um, Zils Olga, I don't know, mm. like some social worker in the car, in the car, uh, with, behind the ambulance, and the guy was trying to comfort us. And I remember, like, in that moment, thinking, my God, this, I, there's no spirituality in this man. Like, mm. somehow I was suffering the hardest moment of my life, but I could comfort the guy more than he could comfort mm. me. Mm. And I remember thinking about how much gifts Guruji gave to us in life, that I can go through such a moment somehow conscious and not killing myself. Mm -hmm. And with a deep understanding of life, then the priest here on my mm -hmm. side that could barely say anything to help me. Mm -hmm. It was such an interesting moment. And then we go to the hospital, they keep trying something, then the doctor say, look, we tried enough, she's gone. Now you have to go to that room, her body's there, only the parents, you stay in the room for some time, you have to be with her and accept. So that's a little baby cold body, and we take in our laps, and we, I call Guruji in this moment, crying like a baby, and Guruji was super cold. Guruji was like, oh, okay. Yeah. Guruji, like, they gave up. Only you can do something now. No, I was with her. She doesn't want to come back anymore. Mm. It's finished. It's okay. And then some days later, he said, no, on the sixth day, actually, when we discovered the thing, on that sixth day, her karma was finished on that planet or whatever she had to do with the okay. family. It was already finished. But you guys prayed so much that we let her longer with you guys mm. so we can have this love experience. And we really had amazing six months, amazing. Mm. I remember when she was born, like in the hospital, the moment she was coming out, I was singing one bhajan. There's, um, oh, mi te ras se baro di lang. Yeah, she was coming out with this bhajan. In the moment I hear she was having bad problems, they didn't tell me she was dead, but on, that she was having a terrible problem, uh, problem an issue in, in the house. On that last day, when I was driving, that same bhajan was in my head. Mm. That's why I don't sing this bhajan live anymore, because when I, my daughter mm. came, I was singing, mm. my mother left, I was singing this bhajan. Mm. And I remember some months later, like coincidentally, Vanamali sang this bhajan in a darshan, and it was such a crazy mm. feeling. But there's more to the story, I have to tell you. Because uh, after, so the, she passed away, Sharda, and we drove back on the next day from Kaiserslautern, where we were, to here, to Torn. We used to live mm -hmm. here, close to the ashram. Right? Guruji was still traveling, <coughs> or again traveling, actually. But uh, Kanjalochan organized all the residents, he called everyone and said, hey, the baby of, of they both, Best. Let's all go to their house. So, half of the residents from the ashram filled all the ashram cars and they drove to oh. to my house. There was I remember it was snowy outside, and that was one of the most amazing experiences of my life because the residents of the ashram they came, they we closed the door, we put down the curtains, no neighbor could see us, and they brought instruments and we started doing sankirtan. Hmm. And I, I remember the feeling of um, spirit of family was so strong, you know, like it was, I don't know, 20, 30 people singing so strongly together. And I know the neighbors for sure think I'm crazy because they know my daughter passed away yesterday and I'm singing whatever mantras now like crazy. But I was, that spirit, spirit of family feeling was so strong that I started to feel blissful. It was one of the most blissful moments of my life. Basically, the night before, I had the hardest moment of my life. 
the day after, I have one of the most blissful moments of my life. Because mm -hmm. my mind stopped, you know, it, every, like, it was broken. And all these people together, and it was, the, I don't know how to describe it, the, the feeling of spirit wow. of family was so crazy. And I, now I know, like, the importance of Sangha. We, we say, oh, Sangha is so important. It's only real devotees can give you real support in such moments. Mm -hmm. Normal people in the world, they can just help you stay down, that's all. Mm -hmm. So I remember crying out of bliss, and me being angry with myself, you cannot be blissful now. Mm -hmm. You have to be sad, but I was crying out of bliss because of the devotees. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And then there was a crazy thing that somebody told me. I believe it was Swami Revati. I'm not sure who told me. Maybe Swami Revati. They said, remember that day when you talked when the phone with Guruji and Guruji said she's okay now on the sixth day. Um, on that day, Guruji was in the room, in the house we were traveling, and Guruji was breathing very badly. Mm. And everybody passed by the room and said, Guruji, do you need water? Do you need something? Guruji, no, no. <coughs> Guruji, what do, what's happening to you? People are really afraid for Guruji. Mm. Guruji in another country. And Guruji said, no, 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 like Tandav's daughter, my name was Tandav. Tandav's daughter will be okay. Uh, what happened to me? Oh, she's sick, but she'll be okay. I gave a piece of my heart to her. Mm -hmm. So imagine, Guruji gave a piece of his physical heart somehow to my baby daughter, so she lives from, instead of passing the sex bonds, we can have like a beautiful love family experience with Guruji holding our hands instead of six days, six months. And then when it has to finish, it's finished. And then it was clear for me, I just, if Guruji along me, I'm going to be a monk. I never asked Guruji. Mm. Um, basically, he just told me, now you can. And then I got initiated. Yeah. Ah, okay. So, that, because that would have been my next question. Like, when did you decide to become yeah. a monk? So that was then clear that... Yeah. After this, that's going to start family life again. I didn't want to, I mean, I also didn't push. I would, letting Guruji drive my life yeah, and, and he, it was very hard of course for my ex-wife and his two good friends but he sent her to Vrindavan because he said no you need some go to Vrindavan she loves Vrindavan and mm -hmm. that, that vibe and that bhav and then when she was there she decided to become Brahmacharini mm -hmm. I remember and yeah. then she became Brahmacharini and some weeks later Guruji calls me and said now you can mm -hmm. he didn't ask do you want because he knew I actually always wanted to become a monk, and that was it. 2015, I became a monk. So that's years. No? Wow. History. Interesting. Really nice. Thank you. Well, I've, it's, <laughs> I don't know what to say. It's like I have more questions, but it feels like this is it's kind of good to conclude there. Maybe as um, as you love kirtan, yeah, mm. like you, 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 uh, you came kriya yoga and you practice your atma kriya yoga. But when I think of you, then I think of kirtan. Yeah, mm. you are, like I said, an amazing musician, and you sing uh, for God since, yeah, since you came here. Mm. Like you say, also before. Um, maybe a few words to Kirtan or to your connection with Kirtan or anything you would like to share with the mm. audience? Yeah, before I met Guruji, I, my spiritual life was meditating and music was yeah, somehow spiritual, but it was something beautiful that I loved, but as a job. I loved, I knew there was something energetical, but I, for me, I would not understand the power of God's name. And Guruji is the person who revealed to me the power of God's name at, to a certain extent, of course. Mm -hmm. But when I, I had my friend, my Hare Krishna friend in Brazil, mm -hmm. and I would make fun of him, you know, like in a good way. But like, hey, you guys don't even do pranayamas. How can you meet God? Mm -hmm. That was my arrogant was mentality. Yeah. And I remember after I met Guruji for some times and 
I experienced some kittens with Guruji and Guruji's talks and something changed inside of me. And then the Kriya is still very important, but somehow I, I, understand, I understood that the problem of God's name is just that it's too simple. Mm -hmm. But it has everything. But because it's too simple, we don't want to believe. But everything is there. You know, and, and we just need to open up to, to have faith and do it because it's himself, you know, mm. nothing else. It's just himself fully. And then I remember uh, after some time, I actually wrote to this friend. I said, oh, you actually were right all along. <laughs> 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 yeah. Then when Guruji gave dashas on, on my city, he borrowed the harmonium. He could not come, but he was really helpful and everything. Mm. So that's, that's the, the message, like... Um, Everything is in God's name. And, and like Guruji said, like we do Japam in the beginning to calm down the mind, the beginning of our career. Mm -hmm. Then you do the other techniques to purify us so that we realize the power of God's name. Mm -hmm. The purification is just for us to realize the power of God's name. So surrender to God's name is everything because there's no difference from, from himself. So that's basically the, the message, um, the kind of joy that comes out from this practice, the, the the kind of transformation that happens inside. But it's very tricky, you know, because Pratishta, you know, like fame and glory. And we all know, like, being basically a musician my whole life, I could always observe how dangerous it is. You get addicted to, to feedbacks, addicted to somebody saying, oh, that was nice, addicted to somebody, at least giving you a smile after you sing a kirtan, you know, mm -hmm. or a song. And, and, we have to be very careful and work on that. Of course, this doesn't change the power of God's name, but it changes how I am open to receive His grace. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if, yeah. And of course, it's for sure, I'm far to be perfect, but I constantly remind me technically about that. You know, mm -hmm. After I do a kirtan or I do a speech, I say Krishna Paramastu, Gurudeva Paramastu, mm -hmm. that's for you. Mm -hmm. and, and hey, you told me once that, yeah. that Gurudev told you, from now onwards, sing only for him. Uh, that was interesting. Yeah, it was, I actually said as a joke, and he said yes. So I was, just before I became a monk, I was living around the ashram, playing less and less outside, but still giving a lot of classes. And then I, I was making a, the Guruji was making a tea for himself. I was not even making a tea of Guruji, <laughs> for Guruji, somewhere by the kitchen. And then I made a, somehow in the conversation, I made a joke. Ah, Guruji, maybe now I stop playing outside, I just sing for God. But I didn't fully mean it. Mm -hmm. I just threw it out to see. Mm -hmm. And we were having a very casual conversation. But when I said that, Guruji stopped whatever he was doing. There was a, some seconds of silence. He turned back to me and he looked like deep in my eyes and he turned back to his tea. And then I realized, oops, I think I just signed a contract with him. I should <laughs> 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 Something happened. And then actually later on he said, you should just sing God's name. And just sing for God. Yeah. Nice. One last advice or, or thought for anybody who might watch it, might be inspired by your story for their spiritual path or anything which you would like mm. to share. Okay, let's see. I, I would say, like, what made me open to Guruji, of course, it's all Guruji's grace, but we have the support of the Sangha, of the friends, no? Like, in the beginning, Kanjalochana was so close supporting me and explaining things to me and, and, and and let me be inspired by Guruji's and, and experiences. And, and we have to be like this, you know. And, and like we have to associate with people that that gonna change us. When I then came to the ashram or came off the, to the ashram, like the people that we see close to Guruji are the people that inspire us. So like you, Swami Revati. Uh, Swami Kuru was there, and many other people, and Mayuran was actually, this, in this first years, he was not coming that often, mm -hmm. then he came back 
to be often there. Uh, but I remember all these people, they inspired me. And you have to somehow accept it. You know? I think so. What the message that, that came to my mind now is let yourself be inspired by the devotees, that you feel it, because you feel something natural. But we have two choices. We can either ignore it or feed competition or feed jealousy, mm -hmm. or you can be happy for the inspiration, mm -hmm. you know, and be grateful for the chance of meeting, of getting to know somebody like this. So Guruji manifests himself in the form of so many amazing devotees, mm -hmm. uh, and, and we have to be really um, grateful for, for these people and take the chance, take the opportunity, because we don't know like we cannot say how long Guruji will be with us, also all these devotee families, we don't know when each, how long each one of us will be here. And, yeah. and it's sad when, when for some reason you don't see a devotee anymore and have a regret that you never told the person, hey, you are amazing, mm -hmm. thank you. you know? To so, appreciate the devotees. Appreciate the, the devotees. Of the devotees. Yeah, it's a good advice. I, I take that also always for myself and when somebody new comes to say like, Look at the good sides of the devotees, because obviously, till you have not attained perfection, there is always also mm. the other side. And yeah. like when we are in competition or jealousy or whatever, then we focus on that. But no, focus on the good side of people, and yeah, be in the presence of devotees. Um, I hope you liked this interview. I definitely did. I, like, I have no idea how long it was. Well, we see. <laughs> Thank you very much for. Thank for you your so openness, for sharing, um, and yeah, very really nice. Take a good day. Take a good day, bro. <laughs> nice. Take a good day. <laughs>